So I have a little challenge for you. You're playing this puzzle game and you're trying to open these doors with this ceiling button. It can only be activated by a box though. So naturally you push this box down the slope to reveal that it actuates a little piston. Hmm, two boxes and two buttons. Oh, obvious. You move this box right here on the piston and when you push that other box, the puzzle is solved. Except not really. And if you thought that, it perfectly illustrates the design philosophy I'm about to describe. If you're looking for a comprehensive analysis of puzzle design, this ain't it. You might want to check out someone with a more British accent for that. So you guys pointed out that I should talk more about the design in my own games. And this is just that. A long time ago, like almost 10 years ago, I was working on a game called Concern Joe that never really got released. It was a precursor to Move or Die, but instead of a party game, it was designed to be a single player puzzle platformer. You would go through a series of portal inspired chambers solving puzzles while having to constantly move so you won't die. Now, when it comes to designing puzzle levels in general, the good formulas out there rely on a lot of variables playing nice together. But in a more simplified essence, the player shouldn't be figuring out the goal, but the process. In this early level from Portal, the goal is immediately clear. You have to get to the exit door that is right in front of you. But the question is how? And from there, you work backwards, realizing that there is a platform leading to that exit door that is connected to this thing that can be powered by that thing, and so on and so forth. Not bad. I forgot how good you are at this. We have a lot of tests to do. I haven't really had any formal education in game design or any prior experience with puzzle design, so back then I was kind of making things up as I went, taking inspiration from games I've played and a handful of GDC talks. So in my process of coming up with creative puzzles for my game, I realized I kept using an interesting design pattern that I still think it holds up today. Since it's something I kind of made up as a young developer. Okay, editing Nick here. Just to clarify, I haven't invented this concept since it existed a long time before young me stumbled upon it, but it's still not properly documented. So for all intents and purposes, I'm going to claim that I came up with it myself and you will play along. Okay? Okay. I'm not sure if it has a formal name, so for the sake of this video, I'll call it the double take puzzle design. Actually, you know what? Let's make it sound official by giving it its own title screen. The core idea behind this concept is to present a seemingly easy puzzle to the player, followed by subverting their expectation when they try the first and most obvious solution for that puzzle. Going back to the earlier example, based on how this level is designed, the first instinct is to push this box down the slope and see that it makes this piston go up. There is a button on the ceiling, so the logical solution is to push this box back up and use this other box to solve the puzzle. And indeed, you've solved the puzzle, but now you're stuck on the wrong side. You've fallen in the designer's trap. So the solution is making sure that you push both boxes from the left side, solving the puzzle while leaving you on the correct side of the level. Come on, I'm renaming you to stupid.png. That was the game's narrator, by the way. And this is the beauty of this type of puzzle design. The game presents you with a seemingly simple puzzle with an equally simple and obvious solution. This encourages you as the player to use vertical thinking, basically a straightforward approach of what's immediately intuitive. And in turn, this gives you an immediate short-term goal, something to do right away, as well as a small confidence boost. However, that obvious solution was purposefully presented as the first thing you should do while being intentionally designed to not work. So when that solution doesn't work, you are forced to rethink your approach from a new perspective. In other words, you must use lateral thinking to tackle the new problem. This leaves you in a position where you are more familiar with the puzzle layout since you have already interacted with it. You now know that this button activates this piston, so you're now left in a position having to recontextualize your surroundings because you realize the game was actually two steps ahead all along. And this is where the double take puzzle name comes from. Because the player starts out with vertical thinking due to the framing of the level and throughout the 
little twist, they transition to lateral thinking shortly after, highlighting a contrast between those two distinctive ways of approaching the problem. I made use of these individual concepts earlier in the game. For example, the player has to constantly move in order to regenerate health and stay alive. But there are also these white ground tiles in the game that don't regenerate your health when you run over them. So at the expense of the player's sanity, I had a little fun with subverting expectations. Good job, you found the suicide button. Now, in terms of recontextualizing, there is this elevator ride in the beginning of the game before you get the whole move or die mechanic and you don't really pay attention to it. It's a simple scripted event you've seen a million times before in other games. But a few minutes later, the move or die mechanic is introduced and the elevator ride happens again and being stuck in a small space now feels completely different when you have to move in order to regenerate your health. So this is recontextualizing the same environment through the lens of a new mechanic. Those two examples were not really puzzles, but they display the individual use of subverting expectations and recontextualization. So let's take a look at some of those concepts coming together to form some proper double take puzzle levels. At this point, you are already familiar with the temporary tiles that disappear when you touch them, because the game taught you this earlier. So you approach this new level and you see a long bridge of temporary tiles with certain death underneath them. You think, pfft, this is easy. So you start running across. And only a few seconds later, you stumble upon a button that opens a hatch at the beginning of that bridge. You are now stranded, forcing you to recontextualize and change your approach by respawning and trying to figure out a way of crossing this bridge that would allow you to return as well. Maybe jumping would help. Oh yeah? How are you gonna get back now, genius? Wow, I didn't expect that to work. Here is another puzzle example that I'm really fond of that makes use of the timer buttons. These are buttons that can only be activated by you, not a box. However, simply touching them won't do it. So you must keep them pressed for a few seconds for them to activate, which puts some pressure on the player with the whole move or die mechanic. But you already know this because the game already introduced all these concepts earlier. Now, this timer button right here is your end goal. It's clearly marked that it opens the exit door. So you push this box out of the way to get access to the first button. And this gives you access to another box. Cool. You now naturally push this new box to the right all the way in that hole. So far, so good. The level kind of guided you to do these actions without much thinking. You then push this other box in that hole since building a tower to reach the button is the intuitive thing to do and oof, you're one box short from reaching it. You jump and you try your best to glitch it open but it doesn't work. You need one extra box but it's all the way over there and there is no way to get it out, right? At this point, you have all the information you need in order to solve this puzzle and I honestly want you to pause the video and try to figure it out. Yay, homework, I know, but I don't actually want you to leave a comment or anything like that. Just honestly see if you can figure out the solution to this simple puzzle. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, here's the solution. You don't actually need another box. All you have to do is only push this box halfway through, which allows you to stand on it and reach the timer button. Every tile and element in this level was specifically placed to lead to this moment, including that seemingly useless first box, which misleads the player into thinking that they can get it out of there somehow. And after watching hundreds of people play this level, I can confirm that this design works as intended. I think it's important to be careful with keeping the expectation subversion in check, because too much of it can lead to the player getting mentally exhausted. Just like any example I present in this video probably won't have the same effect on you now that you are familiar with this concept. Stanley walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. I have also noticed this type of puzzle design predominant in other games like Snakebird, Steven Sausage Roll and specifically level 7 in Baba Is You. One good example is in Play Dead's Inside. You sneak into this room with a shiny red button, so obviously you press it. The water goes down and the door opens. You walk out and see another red button. Pfft, 
Easy, you press this one as well and the water starts going up and as you continue to go right you see your goal, a doorway that shuts close as soon as the water level allows you to reach it. Fuck, the game was two steps ahead all along. What do you do now? You naturally swim back, drop down through a hatch and you're back where you've started. You are now forced to recontextualize your approach and try something different. I'll actually let you play the game to figure that one out and I know I'm horrible for leaving you hanging, but let's actually get back to Concern Joe for a second and break down the design and my thought process behind one of the earlier puzzles. So boxes are an absolute must when it comes to puzzle games, no questions asked, it's basically the law. So in order to introduce the player to box physics in my game, I have designed this fairly simple level. Quick homework time again. With the knowledge you have so far, try pausing the video and analyze this level both from my perspective as the designer as well as how you think most players will try to solve the puzzle. I'll give you a few seconds again. I'm hoping you have already figured out how I designed this puzzle to subvert the player's expectations, so here was my thought process. The player walks in from the left, at which point the lights go on to highlight this box. Given that it's right in the path of the player, it's very likely that they will simply run into it and push it off the ledge. However, most players will push it off the ledge and then pause before running off themselves, which would put them in an unintuitive position after landing with the box on the left and the button on the right. This doesn't feel right right. I want the level to be better at guiding the player, so I made a little narrative scripted event that reverses the box gravity for a few seconds as soon as the player touches it. Whoops, that's not supposed to happen. The game's narrator makes a remark about that to justify it and there is a very conveniently placed notch in the ceiling to make sure that the box stops at this specific point, after which the gravity is fixed and the box lands right next to the button. This improved positioning gives the player a much clearer direction of what to do next. It encourages vertical thinking. Simply push the box on the button and done. The doors open but there is a second set of doors and there is one button left in the level. Easy, simply go there and jump, oh fuck, you can't reach it. At this point the player has realized that they have to undo their first action. This is the point where they switch to lateral thinking. So they move the box off the button in order to use it so they can reach that timer button. And the placement of that timer button is very intentional on the wall, so the player has to actively hold down the left key in order to run into it and slowly activate it as they're losing health, reinforcing the move or die mechanic. These buttons are also designed to take a specific amount of time to trigger so the player is left with around 10% health by the time they activate. Once that button goes green, the player can now put the box back on the first button and clear the level. Okay, maybe you are a tiny bit clever, I'll give you that. I can still delete you whenever I want, so don't push your luck. Oh, and if you ever design a 2D puzzle platformer with boxes that can only be pushed, not pulled, you'll quickly find out that players can get boxes stuck in corners by simply pushing them too far, without any way of getting them back. Fear not, I have developed an easy and elegant solution, slanted corner tiles. This way boxes simply roll back if they are pushed too far, and you can use this in every corner of your level as well as decorating the ceiling, they work every single time. You have my mental checkpoint guarantee. Now all of the previous examples from Concern Joe were mostly about simple box and button puzzles, but the game was all about introducing new mechanics to play around with for each level. For example, at one point the game narratively glitches out and causes the previous version of you to linger around, enabling you to use it as a physics object, and I tried to use this mechanic in creative ways to reinforce this type of puzzle design. You could use that corpse to clear previously impossible jumping gaps or even as a stepping stone in order order to reach higher platforms. One of my favorite uses of this mechanic was requiring the player to die and then move the corpse in a specific spot. They then have to get on it to get a little bit higher, at which point they must jump and time their death at a precise moment in mid-air so they fling their corpse over a wall and activate a button. A little bit morbid, I know, but very fun. These mechanics would disappear after a handful of levels, only to be replaced by new, fresh concepts. I just coded a wall jumping mechanic in, let's see if it works. For some reason it also disables your green and blue channels, how odd. So this was my silly little puzzle design philosophy I stumbled upon many years ago and called it the double take puzzle design. 
I think it has a great potential when it comes to guiding the player and create memorable puzzle designs by subverting expectations, so I can only hope it's going to show up in more games in the future. Now, the problem is I don't really have a satisfying conclusion or ending for this video, so what I'm gonna do is still play that outro music like I just said something super smart and mind-blowing. Okay, between you and me, because you got this far in the video, I think you should leave a comment pointing out how insightful and mind-blowing that conclusion was for all the viewers out there who never reached the outro. Oh, also, even though it was never released, it's been almost a decade since I have worked on the design of Concern Joe, and to this day, people still ask me when is it going to come out, so I guess I can finally use this opportunity to officially announce that the reason why it 